mother's language. My name is Stephanie Cabanana Kiyambakos, and thank you so much for joining us for another event in our Ears Wide Open series. Each of these conversations are designed to give you the chance to discover more about our music and to hear from world-class artists, producers and composers working on the stage and behind the scenes here at the NSA. Thank you to our Ears Wide Open presenting partner, Tarawara Estate, for their support of these events. MSA will be presenting Ears Wide Open events throughout the year and you can either watch live on YouTube or join us right here in the auditorium. Make sure you subscribe to the MSA YouTube channel to ensure you hear about these upcoming events. We also want to hear from you tonight, so please add your questions on to YouTube and to our in-house audience, we'll have some mics roaming around at the end too. We gather here tonight in an area where people have gathered for thousands of years. We're in the Iwaki Auditorium. It's just behind Firarung, which you might know as the Yarra River. And it's here in Nam or Melbourne, that we humbly offer our deepest respects to the traditional custodians of this unceded land, the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation. Our respects as well to their elders past, present, and those emerging future shapers. This has been a place of celebrating, mourning, sharing, and passing on knowledge through gatherings with music over millennia of generations. Tonight, in our own way, we too gather in exploring the diversity of styles and influences and new forms of expression found in music on this land today and where it's likely to go. Australia's community of classical and classically connected composers and makers are diverse, multi-dimensional, multidisciplinary, and multi so many things, as we'll discover with a panel of incredible artists to help us unpack these questions. How do you define Australian music? And how will music in Australia sound like in future? Let's meet this panel. To my right, we have Aaron Wyatt, a violist, conductor, programmer and researcher, originally from Perth, who moved to Melbourne to take up a position at Monash. A passionate advocate for new music, he is a long-term member of the Decibel New Music Ensemble and developed the group's cutting-edge animated graphic notation software for the iPad, the Decibel score creator and score player. We have Miranda Hill, a producer, double bassist, G. Violonis, <laughs> performer, teacher, who specialises in producing concert platform and community music events and performing historically informed and contemporary classical music. Miranda is the founder and artistic director of Experimental Music Ensemble, Three Shades Black and Homophonic. Lisa Lim is a composer. She's interested in how ideas and creativity arise from ecological connection and the way the stories you tell co-create reality. She is the Sculthorpe Chair of Australian Music at the Sydney Conservatorium of Music where she leads the Composing Women program. Current and upcoming projects in include a piano concerto for Tamara Stefanovic and the Luxembourg Philharmonic Orchestra. And Robin Fox is a multi-award winning composer and audiovisual artist who's recognised globally for his innovative AV laser works and scores for dance. He is co-founder, artistic director and CEO of MESS, the Melbourne Electronic Sound Studio. I know for a fact that they are all award-winning. They are all amazing and they are all hours for the next hour to unpack <laughs> this conversation. Let's make them welcome. <laughs> so an hour is going to zip by when we're talking about the future. In fact, we're already in it right this second. So I feel like before our brains start to slip into a new time-space continuum thinking about the future, we should maybe go through a few understandings to launch this conversation. Starting with you, Aaron, how do you define Australian music? Cool. So just an easy, brief question just to start with. Just a little with, right? light one to <laughs> kick it off. Uh, I think I was, I was joking earlier that I, it feels like an accent of geography that I'm the person starting here. And it, it's a fairly apt description for Australian music, an accent of geography. I mean, it, it's really music by Australians. And I think it, it covers such a broad range of different genres, different styles. It's really sort of hard to pin down. So I think 
the only thing that I can say about it is that it's it's music by Australians. And then the tricky thing is, well, how do we you know, pin down what it is to be Australian? And that's just an even bigger question. Um, but that would <laughs> that would be the short of it. <laughs> <laughs> sure. And for you, Miranda, how do you define Australian music? Um, uh, to kind of build on what Aaron was saying, I think it is, yes, you know, it's obvious it's music by Australians or music performed or created within, well, music created within Australia. But because Australia is such, an, Australia is such a new country um, and it's so influenced from so many places, I think it's actually a really beautiful opportunity to define Australian music as all of the influences that create the society that's outside these doors and inside these, the inside these doors as well right now. Um, you know, we don't have that uh, Western colonial Australia does not have that, you know, you talk about Viennese music, you've got a lot of history written down that tells you exactly what Viennese music is and we are actually freed from that. Um, obviously Indigenous Australians, Australian music existed for a very long time, I'm no way discounting that and that is part of Australian music. Uh, but we've got an opportunity to create Australian music because we're not, we're not tied down by what has been studied in first year, uh, first year music, musicology for the last 50 years. <laughs> Good answer. Yes. For you, Lisa, where does this question take you? Yeah, um, I'm going to use my ecological kind of language and lens around that. And once you start thinking ecologically, which is this idea that everything is profoundly interdependent, right? Uh, you move away from thinking about things as sort of more fixed and static um, objects to relationships. So I think about this question in terms of a whole set of changing relationships. Um, shifting relationships which are histories and lines of or stories. Um, so I just want to, to, to connect a little bit to what Miranda said about how we're not fixed. Actually, I think there are lots of things that are fixed in Australian music and, and, and the past is very much in our present and the stories from the past still make their way through and are expressed in the present. Um, but hopefully it's, um, you know, that they're able to be, to be shifted and, and transformed. So I have this rather fluctuating idea of what Australian music is, which is more contingent perhaps. And it's like, you know, who are you? You know, what place are you in? What are the, what are the things coming through in that constellation? And that is, that is the form of Australian music that's being expressed in that time and place. And it's going to be different in, in other places. So, yeah, I kind of resist the it's one thing. It's many, many, yeah, it's a myriad of things. I'm a fan of the multi-multi. <laughs> Robin, for you. Well, following on from that, I guess it's like asking what is Australian food? You know, we have the same problem when we try and define it, don't we? So we do have one of the longest continuing traditions uh, on the planet here, and then we have a colonial presence, and then we have an incredible multicultural society. We've got all of that and so um, I often wonder about the efficacy or necessity to to even talk about nationhood in relation to music at times I think that we've learnt at least over the 20th century and well before that 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 nationhood can be a very toxic idea and and I I sometimes wonder about it I, I often argue with people about the difference between being proud of where you come from which you had absolutely no say in and taking pride in where you come from which is a different idea and it's about respecting where you where you're from and respecting the people around you so as far as I'm concerned like when I make music I don't think is this Australian music I don't I don't think about the smell of eucalypts or the you know the call of the kookaburra I'm not I don't think about that when I'm making music it's not important to me um, what's important to me is um, is what I'm doing and the communication with the people around me. And, and I think that since we have entered a very globalized world now, that communication can be, you know, with anybody, anywhere, anytime. Mm. Uh, and I think that there are perils and dangers in that. And I also think that there are very good things about nationhood as well, I must say. I'm not, I'm not a radical lunatic. I just think that, you know, for me, um, it, when, I, when I'm asked that question, you know, what is Australian music? I kind of think to myself, I don't care. <laughs> like it's not important yeah. to me in a, in a way you know yeah well thinking about globalization as you were just mentioning and your practice Lisa we're in the age of the Anthropocene right now so 
this terminology that's used looking at uh, the time from which humans have first started to have a physical impact into our globe. This is our age. And a lot of your work looks at ecological connections. How, how does sound become the medium for you to connect with these themes? Mm. I think music is, for me, one of the ultimate ecological mediums of knowing um, in that it's really a multimodal um, um, activity, a practice. It's not just sound, but it's, it's, it engages so many you know, areas of who we are and our bodies and our, our connection to everything around us. So it's a way of knowing that, that kind of interconnection at a really um, pre-verbal, you know, profound level. So I think music is, is a really essential um, and amazing way of expressing some of these ideas. Um, so it's not just, I mean, like I, I will pick up on so-called um, environmental themes, you know, around extinction of particular species. I mean, it's a little bit doomy. <laughs> um, but also thinking more abstractly in terms of time, um, I think that, that connects to what you're saying, you know, what we, we, we don't live with a sense of linear time anymore. Uh, you know, we have access to different time periods and a sense of, you know, there's micro level time and perhaps during COVID people have felt that they're in this kind of weird vortex. Of, time had a different know. meaning, right, for everybody. Yeah, where time is going too fast or too slow. Um, but the sense of, of sort of geologic time that's opened up to us because of our awareness of, of these kind of huge processes. Um, they're, they're all things I think that as artists we can also respond to, you know, at a, at a sort of aesthetic level as well, you know, that, that feeds into how we think about making art. And that, mm. that for me is just one of the really exciting um, and, and perhaps the silver lining of living in our times, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, thinking further, Aaron, around time and this time, 2020, 2021, has seen such a global shift in a lot of different ways, especially around inclusivity and how we're looking at each other as, as people who we've excluded in the past, who we're including now and mechanisms to do better in these spaces. You're the musical director of Ensemble du Tala and that's a relatively new ensemble you know, in the music scene. Can you take us through how it's developed and how it sits now within the Australian music landscape? Yeah, so it started basically this year. It was kind of launched um, January this year. Uh, so Deborah Cheatham initially started this one day in January project. The idea being that um, she wanted to gather a bunch of indigenous classical musicians um, on the 25th of January. Mm -hmm. And you know, that was symbolic of the last day before colonization. So it's sort of the, the last, I guess, day of self-determination of, of sovereignty. Uh, sovereignty. Um, and you know, gathered together um, uh, all the, the indigenous classical musicians she could find, and there aren't a huge number of us, uh, but get them in the one place and, and be able to actually just you know, play together and, and you know, sit down and, and you know, play all sorts of music. Uh, we were doing some new works by uh, Brenda Gifford, um, and she has played in the ensemble uh, as well, even though she's not so much in the classical sphere. Um, as well as you know some of the great Western classical works, because you know why why shouldn't these be accessible to Indigenous people? Um, and it's just it it's kind of fortunate that that I sort of got involved in it because I, I hadn't heard about the project, and a friend of mine just got in touch with me on Facebook saying I was listening to ABC Classic FM and Deborah Cheatham was talking about a, a call out for Indigenous classical musicians. <laughs> musicians, and I was like, well, and I just moved to Melbourne at the time um, to Monash once again under the guise of sort of trying to get more. Uh, engagement in the course with Indigenous music and trying to get more Indigenous, I guess, you know, students into the course. Mm. Um, what is the course? Oh, uh, just the Bachelor of Music at Monash. Great. Yeah, so um, it was kind of, I've been meaning to talk to Deborah because she's such a, a big name and big personality in the space and she's done some you know, really amazing work. So it was just a really sort of happy coincidence that I found out that she was putting this ensemble together and I, I reached out to her via email, got in touch, said, hey, I'm interested. Mm. And um, yeah, so we, we met for the first one day in January project, I think it was now two years ago. Mm. Um, so it was myself, um, a few other indigenous um, players, Lara Patterson Briggs on double bass, um, 
uh, Baden, uh, I can't remember his last name. Ah, Baden Hitchcock, of course, as I said, the Hitchcock brothers and sisters. Uh, mm. So Baden Hitchcock, who's a principal dancer with Bangara. So there's, uh, there are quite a few people who, you know, music wasn't their primary thing. But, but they're multidisciplinary. They're multidisciplinary, yeah. and they'd, they'd kept up with their instrumental practice, you know, beyond, you know, high school, and so we're still able to play at a, a relatively, high, you know, high enough level to, to be involved. Um, and so it really, especially in those first two years before it sort of, I guess, coalesced and was formalized into Ensemble Dutala, it was just really a safe space to bring, you know, indigenous classical musicians together so that we could actually, you know, play in a space where normally there aren't that many of us around. Like I was a, for just over a decade, I was a very regular casual with the WA Symphony Orchestra and mm -hmm. It was me. That was it. That was a, the <laughs> indigenous representation there. And, and you know, going back to the youth orchestra, there was, you know, Weo, um, you know, they had the foresight to put together an indigenous scholarship. But the, the problem is, it's 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 trying to attract you know younger indigenous kids towards classical music, and then also getting them to to you know stick with it through, you know, the no, the many years that it takes to get to the level where you can be in the youth orchestra. So, you know, even when you have a scholarship at the youth orchestra level, it's like for so many years running, it's like I was the indigenous scholarship <laughs> recipient by virtue of being the only indigenous player mm. there. And, you know, I was already at a level where it's like I didn't really need to be, in, I mean, I was already doing it. Yeah. And I was already at a, at a fairly high-ish level. Not that I'm going to turn down a scholarship, but, yeah. you know, it, it's it's a really, I mean, it, Ensemble de Tire, I guess, is, is trying to address these sorts of issues and trying to get a bigger presence to show that Yes, there are indigenous classical musicians out here. So for those younger players who are potentially up and coming, it's like, you know, there's this environment where you can play and feel welcome and, and you know, not feel like this is sort of not music for you or be you know, mm. siphoned off, in, off into the pop world. Um, so it's, it's, I think it's, it's a really encouraging thing. We've, it's sort of combined with a scholarship program as well. So we had our first scholarship recipient this year. Um, uh, sort of, I think he's year 12 this year, Jackson Morley, a cellist, mm. um, who got to come along to the one day in January um, sort of project, the Ensemble Dutal launched this year, and, you know, got to, you know, found himself in a situation where he was able to play all these works with all these other Indigenous players, and also, you know, we need to, we're still at a stage where, numbers-wise, we need to pad out the ensemble with, um, you know, friends and guests who are, I guess, you know, sympathetic to, to the idea. Um, and it, it, you know, for, for a young player like that, it gives them an, an idea of actually what it's like to play in amongst um, professional players mm. and gives them, I guess, the, the chance to really see that maybe this could be something for, for them. And, you know, for someone like Jackson, you know, he's someone who might actually be able to go on and, and pursue a career and, and kind of currently has that interest. So if we can keep fostering that, it'll be, it'll be fantastic. Mm. Um, and, you know, I, it's... It's interesting because, you know, it's it's not like I, I felt really out of place growing up when I was doing it, um, but, you know, it, it's nice to have that inclusivity, and I feel like you know, it it kind of it matters. You need to see it. Exactly. You need to see yourself in a place, and it's hard to do that when you don't see anybody else who's mm. got some similarities that are fundamental to your being. Mm. It, it's something I definitely resonate with being the only Rwandese classical musician in Australia <laughs> at current. I think if there's anyone out there, please let me know. It would be lovely to connect with more. Um, but, you know, certainly I was I was always the only African in the room mm. with, with a lot of classical ensembles and, and that became that became difficult mm. to, to kind of see a future um, and part of the reason why I moved towards composition because then I didn't have to be up on this stage. I could write and collaborate with other people to be up on this stage and doing things because I just felt it was, it was you know, really tough and, and really mm. isolating. And, you know, I think, as I said, I was a, for a very long time a very regular casual with the WA Symphony Orchestra and, you know, it's not like that was an unwelcoming, I mean, it's a very competitive environment being in the, the sort of classical orchestras around the country anyway. But, um, you know, it, it didn't feel like it was an unwelcoming environment. And, you know, it's, it's you know, they're a great bunch of people. But, you know, to, to try and, the, the issue is trying to get, as a young Indigenous classical musicians, to, to just stick with it and actually get to a level where they could, could consider, you know, pursuing music at university and then onto that sort of professional level. Mm.
um, which is a tricky thing. So if there are if there are any indigenous classical musicians watching this, especially up and coming ones, Ensemble Dutala could be for you. <laughs> yeah, the, the call is out there for sure. And Miranda, th thinking again further on inclusivity, your long running series Homophonic turns 10 this year. Happy birthday, Homophonic. Take us back to day one. <laughs> Where did the thought come from? How, what is homophonic and where did the CEDA thought come from or was it more of a need to launch this project? Oh, look, I wish at this point, 10 years down the track, I could say it was a need, but it was a, it was a programming gimmick. Yeah, and then I discovered it was a need. So, um, so homophonic is a show, a classical music show, chamber music, all featuring music written by queer, trans and gender diverse uh, composers uh, and it's a as I said I, I wanted to put a show I just started making my own shows and I wanted to put something in the Midsummer Festival M Melbourne's Gay and Lesbian Festival and this is what I came up with and it was it was a programming gimmick the first one I, I really I should go back and rewrite that but that's the truth <laughs> um, <laughs> but I'd never put on a chamber music concert like this before I kind of I put it in the program we made a little we made a thing it was like a it was a one hour show, we rehearsed it, we arrived and it was sold out. And we're like, oh, okay, right. Uh, and it has consistently, we're now up to, we're doing four shows this year, as well as a five show regional tour around Victoria to all the Victorian Pride Festivals and we sell out. And that tells me actually, I didn't know there was a need, mm. um, but there is. And it's a really interesting thing to take from you know, what, what you were both discussing, I'm very rarely the only queer in the room, right? When you walk into a classical music, I'm not the only person in, in the space. I think if you're a trans or gender diverse person, that's a different experience. But for myself as a cisgender, white, uh, white gay woman, I'm not, I'm not actually the only woman often, yeah. Uh, if I was, <laughs> there's a lot of men, uh, but if there's less, less of us specifically, but I never felt that. But then I, what I've realized was that the audience needed it. Mm. Um, so what we've curated over the 10 years is kind of a homonormalist audience space. Anyone who comes into Homophonic, anyone who buys a ticket and takes a seat in that seating bank, you are within our space now. This is queer space. Um, and we're assuming everyone is queer until proven otherwise inside that space, right? And obviously, you know, it's, it's cultural and it's celebratory. Uh, and it, it felt like now once I've done more research that a lot of people, we've known that there's a lot of, you go back through the, through the canon, you know, you've got your Tchaikovsky and you've got your, your little, uh, mind blank on any others, of course, at this moment, but, um, <laughs> but they're, they're known, but it's not always in the program notes. And that is changing. Over the last 10 years, that has changed. And I, I remember vividly playing, I think, Marla Ten and a work by Tchaikovsky on the same program, and the, they talked all about Elma. And they talked about Elma, he discovered Elma was cheating on him, and, and he wrote the symphony, and rah, 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 and there was a love letter addressed to the wrong person, and there's this big, big drama. And then it was uh, Tchaikovsky, it was uh, pathetic, and they didn't mention the young man it was written for mm. on the same program notes. And I was like, oh, okay. So the, it is being straight washed, but what I love about homophonic is just, it's just a giant celebration. <laughs> it's just a big party. Uh, it's a lot of fun. The music can be very serious, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, but now we've moved it into, as I said, the regional tour. And a very important part of that is actually commissioning. We're commissioning a new work for every town of the region, all five regional pride festivals in Victoria, about and honoring a local queer elder and a member of that community. So uh, redressing the balance of what stories get told in art song because uh, it's a very narrow little band of stories that get told. Mm. And the two stories we've told so far, uh, every, both times we've played them, everyone's cried. Like, they're, <laughs> they're good stories and they're stories that should be told. Mm. Um, yes, homophonic. <laughs> so that's, that's the lesson to young players. A, a programming glitch can turn out to be your life's work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel that's a very common yeah. story <laughs> across composition and, and musicians in general. Yeah. Robin, for you, you told me a story once recently that your mum made computer music in the days when computers were the size of rooms 
and your stepfather ran a music department at La Trobe. Your work is firmly in the AV art arena. Expand on what that is and how that's potentially connected to classical music. Okay, so uh, my stepfather ran the computer music department at La Trobe University, I should mm -hmm. clarify before. But I always have my lawyer on pulse dial when <laughs> speaking in public. But um, yeah, my mother did make experimental music and computer music um, in the late 70s and early 80s. And so it's, I guess it's always been part of my life. And I, um, she was also synesthetic, and I mm. understand you are as well. So, yeah. um, you know, she had an association between colour and number. And so I always make the joke that I couldn't burp at the dinner table without her telling me that it was a B flat and a slightly off pink or something. Or, <laughs> and every birthday had a correspondence and all this kind of stuff. So, so I guess I grew up in a very sort of strange environment from that point of view. Um, uh, and all I wanted to do was play uh, heavy metal drums. That's all I wanted to do. So uh, I sort of ignored a lot of that and thought everybody was crazy bef until, um, you know, discovering that I had all of those proclivities. Um, I guess the relationship to classical music from my point of view came more through my father who was on ABC Classic FM for 30 years. Colin Fox. Colin Fox, the incredible mm. silky tones. Yes, my the dulcet had. tones. And, um, and so to me, I guess I always associated classical music with the very refined sensibility that my, that my father had and experimental music came from my mother. <laughs> so it's kind of, I don't know, it's, a, it's all a mess for me. It's a Freudian mess in my mind, all of that stuff. But the audio visual stuff happened quite by accident where I was, I was making a lot of noise at that time. I was playing sort of noise and improvised noise and things what like that. What is noise? If what you're is a straight classical noise, listener. Well, noise to me is, is a celebration of the sonic and it's in a very somatic form. It's a, it's a bodily experience of sound. And, and there's actually a funny story that I was playing a noise gig um, with a very famous Japanese noise artist. I was really excited. It was at Footscray Community Arts Centre and my, and my dad was there. So he turned up to the gig and I was like, what the? I, what are you doing here? You know, this is going to completely destroy you. <laughs> and um, and he, he watched the show, and then after the show, he wasn't there. He was, he was gone. And the next day, he called me, and it was so adorable. He just, he just rang, and he said, you know, are you okay? Like, he asked me if I was all right. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, oh, that show you performed last night, it seemed so angry. And I said, no, 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 you're misunderstanding. It's like, to me, it was an expression of the ecstatic. Like, this is sublime to me. This is beautiful to me. This is like, so this idea of, of, of aesthetics and sensibilities has always been sort of a conversation in, in, in my household. But at the time when I was making noise, I, I just plugged, I, I just heard, like, um, anecdotally, that you could plug uh, sound into an oscilloscope and you could see it. Mm. And so I just did that and I was making this kind of quite hideous sound and I was wondering why everybody wasn't loving it and then I plugged it in and one of the interesting things that happened was that there was a, there was a tiny fraction of a second where the sound and the image locked together in this geometrical way which just blew my mind. It was, it was, everything else was terrible but then there was this two seconds where it just went poop, poop, poop and I felt like I'd had a moment of what I now call mechanical synesthesia. I felt like I'd mm -hmm. experienced something that was incredibly neurologically satisfying. And so then I spent a very long time dissecting why that couple of seconds uh, looked the way it did. And, you know, other people have discovered this, you know, since Pythagoras. But for me, this was my, my discovery of the fact that that sound is like just geometry moving through the air. And that, you know, if you take time out of a sine wave, it just draws a circle and the time out of a triangle wave. All the fundamentals of electronic music are basically the fundamentals of geometry. And then you can build with shapes and you can do all of this stuff. And so that's when I started to work with this audio visual uh, connection. Mm. Uh, and, and that's now morphed into these sort of laser works where, and you know, you switch a laser on in a room and everybody turns into a child. It's a phenomenal thing. Even <laughs> or a been cat around since following the dot. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's just really like a cat following the dot, exactly. It's like, it's this really counterintuitive form of light. As soon as you switch it on, everybody's instantly amazed. But, um, and so I guess that that's sort of, for me, the works that I make are, are audio visual works in a very literal sense that the sound and the image are exactly the same voltage you're looking at and you're listening to the same voltage at the same time and um, there is a huge history of visual music and you know synesthetes you know in the classical music world you know famously you know Rimsky Korsakov and Scriabin I think used to come to blows about it because they'd argue about which note was which color of course it's a completely subjective experience but you know after a bottle of vodka no one's thinking about that and you know so there was you know th for a long time and 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 synesthesia is um, disproportionately represented in the artistic community so 
Um, there's long been this kind of romantic idea, I think, that there's this kind of relationship between sound and colour particularly, but also sound and other senses. And um, the history of visual music is really quite a fascinating one. Going through, one of my fav favourite examples of it is that there's a thing called the, the visual harpsichord. It's a, no, the ocular, ocular harpsichord, which was an old, um, beautiful old instrument that somebody built. So it was basically a harpsichord. And then it had a whole lot of candles. This is back in about 1760, I think. A whole lot of candles that had tiny uh, curtains and coloured glass, right? And so every time you pressed a note on the harpsichord, a little curtain would open you know, a little pulley system. And there are none of these in existence anymore because they all burnt down. They all, they, they actually literally all burnt down concert halls, you know, and, but that's, you know, that's going back hundreds of years, this, this interest in trying to understand some connection between, and it goes back to what you were talking about, about pre-verbal communication and the fact that the beautiful thing about sound and for me, noise as much as music, you know, if I don't differentiate between the two, but some people do, is, is that it is that, in, you're having a somatic experience which, which occupies all of your senses all of the time. And uh, you know, now, of course, they can inject all those beautiful inks into the brain and watch it all happening, and you're engaging every single part of your brain when you're engaged with, with music. Mm. You know, sound is, is the fastest sense. You know, there's a reason why you, can, you, you hear a really loud noise and you sort of, I don't want to say it, but you mm. void your bowels. <laughs> Is that a polite way of saying that? But anyway, <laughs> you hear a really loud noise and that's what happens. You know, if somebody turns a bright light on, it's kind of annoying. It, you know, it's a, there's a big difference between those two responses. And so that, that your, your oral sense is just so critically, finely tuned and amazing. And for me, it's actually the primacy in, in those audiovisual works. I'm much more interested in music and sound than I am in lasers and visuals, to be honest. But, um, yeah. but uh, so... Oh, that's a long-winded answer, I do apologise. No, it's, it's delightful and I really appreciate it. Um, and moving on from it, speaking about igniting all of our brains with sound, we are so very fortunate, well, I'm very fortunate as well, to have Aaron Wyatt, violist, and Miranda Hill, double bassist, bring you some sound right now. So I'll invite these two to head up towards... Uh, where they're going to play for you. Just quickly, I'm going to show you a small, um, a small example of what they're bouncing off. And this is a graphic textile score. The textile in the background of it is what I am wearing. And it's a Rwandese print that I brought from back home a few years ago. And there's some weaving on top of it. I'm going to hand this to Aaron so you can head over. And we'll hear them give a musical interpretation their contribution to the conversation of this piece. And as they get ready, I'll also remind people at home watching through our YouTube live channel to make sure you pop in some questions into the comments section as at the end of this talk, we're going to have a moment of Q&A and also to our audience who are with here tonight, we will hand around some mics. So be sure to think of some questions and comments for the end as we get set up.
Luciano, thank you so much to Aaron and Miranda for their conversation contribution, as I call it. So in looking at and, and thinking about the ideas that we were going to talk about tonight, on Saturday afternoon, so that's a few days ago, um, I came up with this particular score. I was sitting and weaving and working, as is my way, um, as a composer that works with graphic scores and graphic tactile scores, so often scores that you have to use your hands to feel, um, and graphic textile scores, so things that involve another layer of fabric, which I am wearing today. Um, I felt like looking towards the future, we really need to start to address how you can have a future without looking at the past and also how that translates in music. We, we can't make music in this present or even dream about how it's going to sound in future unless we've come to it from a particular tradition, understanding, education, that kind of thing. Um, and so Miranda and Aaron bravely <laughs> took on the, the task of um, interpreting this work given that it's, it's so new and made for you and, and for everyone at home, uh, a world premiere of, of this conversation. Um, to really open it up and, and talk about how we can move ahead, again, given that understanding of the musics that have occurred before us. Aaron, you were speaking about before being a, a viola player with the West Australian Symphony Orchestra for a long time through to, you know, recently I think you put on some scary teeth and we're part of a new music <laughs> ensemble venture to yeah, do with side was, shows. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was a very intense show. So it was, <laughs> it was, you know, part music, but also part theatrics. So the, mm. the score, I mean, it's a traditionally notated score, but the rhythms were sort of on the verge of unplayable. So it was kind of meant to be a real struggle to play. Mm. There were moments where, um, so I'd, I'd have to play my viola like this, like a, a gamba and sort of be up off the edge of the fingerboard here in, unison so playing the same notes as the violin who fortunately has one extra string than I do but not so fortunate for me um, <laughs> and yeah just really really you know difficult work to play but really quite as a quite theatrical um, really experimenting with you know pushing the technique mm. of the instrument um, to for both for all these you know different sonic possibilities but also the the, the really heightened visual effects of sort of recreating this this history of Coney Island and this sort of sideshow experience. And as you mentioned, the f the f so we had this, this sort of cut out of felt, these sort of false teeth that we'd made, just you know, line down the middle, lots of lines down there. And we had to, with all sorts of instructions, we had a click track, but we you know, had instructions there like to, to duck and then behind the stand reappear and all sorts of movements to, to other players. Uh, so <laughs> very precisely choreographed. And one of the things that we had to do when we were ducked behind the stand was like surreptitiously put in these false teeth. And then there was this big reveal moment where we're sort of gradually smiling wider and wider with the mouth still closed. And then it sort of starts to open with the eyes going like that. So, <laughs> uh, so it's a very, very, it's a very full on experience for the audience. And, it, it's re and the percussionist who is not only playing drums, but playing guitar like a percussion instrument. Um, still had to learn some proper guitar technique to do it. Um, so she did an incredible job, Kelly Melville. Um, but she plays the role of this proprietor who turns himself into sort of half man, half fish. And um, there's a lot of theatrics around that where sort of she finally disappears under this veil and there's this taxidermied fish head that gets revealed. And <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, kids, if you're tangent, learning viola at <laughs> home, this is where it can lead, oh, this <laughs> is one idea. But, what I was thinking of is, you know, this is such a, a varied um, career that you've had with your music making and and looking at, you know, alternative performance, contemporary performance and the ways in which that's iterated. Like you were saying that this is a fairly standard score, but quite precisely choreographed. You have developed a piece of technology that helps with looking at scores in a graphic way. What led you to that and, and how does that work? Is that part of our music future? Uh, I, I would say for some music, yes. For other music, no. I mean, it, it, once again, it's, it's sort of, it's an approach that really works particularly well for certain types of music, less so for, for other types of music. So the, the concept behind it kind of came about through the Decibel New Music Ensemble. 
So a lot of the works of um, some of the composers in the group, like Cat Hope in particular, uh, had a lot of sort of long drones, sort of long glissandi, that if you were to write them in traditional notation, you would have like bar after bar of just semi breathe not a lot happening. And so, I mean, the, the it, it's very hard to coordinate because there's no real sort of sense of, of traditional pulse mm. that goes along with it. So one of the, you know, one of the ways that people would often try to work around that was to, to just have like, and you know, Cat had this long drawn out graphic of where these glissandi and drones should go. And initially you'd, you'd put this on a, a stand and it was several miles wide and <laughs> yeah. not very convenient to look at. And then you'd have to, you know, look at a stopwatch to try and time these things exactly. Um, as well as, I guess, just having to, to listen to what else was going on with everyone else. But so you'd be sort of flitting back between the stopwatch and the, the score and trying not to get lost in the process. And it really just wasn't the best way to do it. Mm. So the, the, they had the idea of, and uh, you had Lindsay Vickery and Stuart James, two of the other members of the ensemble, um, initially put together these sort of Max patches. So Max is sort of this visual programming language that mostly does audio stuff, but you can do visual stuff in it as well. So they would take one of these long images and just scroll it past a static playhead and you'd read, you know, as your part hit the playhead and, and all of a sudden, you know, you could just follow your line and you'd know you'd be exactly synced up with all the other performers mm. and it, it made life a lot easier. And so, but, you know, there were still issues with that. The scores generally needed to be projected. Um, and we did manage to sort of network the patches together, but there were all sorts of issues that we had with networking and Max and the group got uh, received a sort of grant and applied for and received a grant to develop an iPad version of the app. So, you know, suddenly you've got a tablet that's just sitting very unobtrusively exactly oh, like, nice. yeah, exactly like a traditional piece of music would. Mm. Um, you know, you don't have cables running ev everywhere as we did with the laptops and it's, it's very unobtrusive. Um, so I, I got involved in the, uh, in the programming for that uh, initially with a couple of other people and then I became the sole developer very quickly and then, you know, just kept developing it from there, um, but yeah, for a lot of a lot of these works where you, know, you, you have this sort of non-traditional sense of so that the, rather than treating everything like a series of beats, you know, the time matters, but it's on a much more macroscopic sort of scale. Mm. Um, and actually, we we during lockdown we sort of put together this. Um, uh, sort of kind of podcast concert type series, 20, um, uh, sort of t called Two Minutes From Home. So we had 20 new works by uh, Australian and international composers and six of them were for, from the members of the group. So I, the first time ever I was actually uh, writing a piece for the score player. So it was using it as a composer rather than just a developer, which was, yeah, kind of a lot of fun and <laughs> an interesting, interesting uh, sort of shift of perspective. Um, but we had these, these short two minute pieces that we would all, you know, we'd have a click at the start of the, the score player track so that we could line, you know, when we got all the recordings, we just line up the audio click and put them together even though we were separated by, well, half of the group are in Perth and half of us are here. And the half of us who are here were also isolated in our homes because we, you know, we weren't within five Ks of each other. So couldn't just go and conveniently record things. So it was really, yeah, a project for the time of COVID. But by having that, I said that that sort of, I guess, the strict timing of the score player um, and being able to sing them, it, it, it really worked well, uh, worked quite well. Mm. So my piece was, like my partner has a rather extensive jewelry, jewelry collection and I kind of had the idea of, of just using these. I just got a whole bunch of them, placed them on our scanner, scanned them in and sort of played around with them in, in um, uh, the GIMP, which is sort of like a free Photoshop replacement for Linux. and. Um, yeah, created this long score out of them. Uh, and then also, created, so the idea of the ensemble as well is that we do a lot of works, well, most of our works have an electronics component as well. So it's uh, for acoustic instruments married with electronics. Um, so I created the, the electronic track just using recorded sounds from, from this jewelry as well. You know, some just you know, scraping chains across the table, jingling things together and gradually building up this, this louder and louder soundscape of a a relatively short period of two minutes, but um, yeah, and so it was interesting watching the the, the different approaches that the different composers had to this, sort of I guess, you know, stemming from from the lockdown experience. There's a lot that that spoke specifically to to the pandemic, and and I guess mine, in a way, spoke to that sort of being confined at home and just dealing with, you know, ordinary domestic everyday objects to to create this sonic landscape. 
And moving forward, how could people start to engage with this type of technology or the uses of these technologies in their mu music making across the globe? Yeah, so it, once again, it really, it really depends what sort of music you're, you're trying to create. And I mean, there are, we're looking at developing other, we have kind of developed other animation paradigms than just the basic scrolling score, which works better for certain types of, of scores. Um, and so for certain types of sounds that, that you might want to create. Um, but it's, it's basically as, as easy as just creating an image file, putting it into the score creator, and then you can just airdrop it to the score player in an iPad and press play. So you just have to fill in a few details like, you know, composer name, piece mm -hmm. name, how long you want it to scroll for, and then you can just put it straight on the iPad. And uh, one, of the, one of the really good things about it is that you can do you know, with, with animated notation, there are some things that you can convey incredibly easy that would be really hard to do with traditional notation. Even to the point of, um, you know, there are, this is outside of the score player, but people like Ryan L. Smith, who was working with, um, there's a piece of his, I think it's study number eight, and it's a series of sort of these graphic metronomes on a screen, and you just have to hit your instrument when, you know, the metronome ticks left or right. But all of these metronomes sort of, phase out gradually. So you get this really complicated phasing happening that, you know, you would, if, you, if you're doing that with traditional notation, it would take highly trained percussionists a very long time to get it anywhere near that exact. Whereas you can just throw this at a bunch of amateur musicians, explain how to do it, and they can, can just Becomes perform it accessible. like that. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of, uh, it's almost like the democratization of, of some of these, you know, otherwise difficult concepts. Which leads into what you do, in a way, Robin, with Mess, the Melbourne Electronic Sound Studio, if I'm, That's the one. I'm remembering correctly, in keeping your doors accessible, in that mm. so often we thought of technology and music as a little bit of a club. It's like mm. the, the computer geek dudes in the corner that keep to themselves in yep. hushed tones doing their thing um, and not always sharing their knowledge of, of how they've come to use it. At Mess, you have an education program to teach people using how to use, you know, these uh, instruments that you've inherited and develop. How do you see the future of music engaging with the technologies that you're using? Well, I think the the main remit for Mess is to just not con not convince people, but just to let let everybody know really that the creative process is not just the province of the, of artists and people in the arts. It's, it's all about access to the entire history of electronic sound in instrumental form. That's one thing, and we have amassed this, you know, one of the biggest collections anywhere in the world that's publicly accessible. So it's a phenomenal resource, but it's, it, for me, it's not so much about the technology. Um, it's much more about the access to these things that are usually behind glass, that are usually inaccessible, but also that are, have become these incredibly arcane and difficult to understand things. But I, I have problems with, with the way, you know, and you talk about the club, let's face it, it was a sausage party and still is. And, you know, there's a huge amount of work that needs to be done in, the, in that kind of area. In the, um, sorry, I'm very crass, sorry, I apologize. <laughs> but it's like, it, it, it really is, and it's something that we're very conscious of at Mess, and it's something that we are really trying to combat because when we opened the institution, it could easily have filled up with bearded nerds like me in five minutes, and that would have, you know, been a disaster. So. Um, what we're trying to do there is, is not just convince, we're not trying to evangelize about the form of electronic music, it's much more about the creative process and being open to creative possibility and, and, and coming in, whoever you are, I just believe everyone should make music even if you think you can't, that's my philosophy and that's the, that's the philosophy of the, the composer that I inherited my electronic music studio from, it was Keith Humble who started the electronic, who started the La Trobe University Music Department in the 70s and was a family friend who was around all the time. And when he arrived in Melbourne in the late 60s, um, he found the establishment to be a very conservative thing. So he sort of broke into the Granger Museum, which at that time was under sheets and not even accessible to people. And he set up his electronic music studio there and he invited people in. Kids, ran workshops for kids, anybody who would come and say, come and check out this new technology, this is amazing. Look at what you can do with it. You can explore the entire 
you know, the universe of sound is available to everybody. And this was his philosophy. He's an incredibly generous person in that way. And when I inherited those machines, um, one of the logical things that I wanted to do with that is to make do the, a similar thing. You know, the, you know, these things are now my superannuation, and I didn't buy them. You know, these things they fell from heaven, and they're beautiful antiques. And the the idea is that you know, what would Keith have done with them? Well, he would have just said to everybody, come and use them, and come and, and get in front of it. And um, you know, I think that, I mean, music technology has been kind of quite maligned, I guess. And you know, people. When, when electronic music first started appearing, you know, a long time ago now, it's actually quite, quite a developed form, obviously, but when it first appeared, the, the fear was that it was, you know, there's always that fear about the future that we're going to be replaced by technology. We still live with that anxiety now with the singularity and artificial intelligence, and we're all going to be dominated by this, by this force, which, of course, is just a human thing. Um, we should be much more worried about humans than artificial intelligence, in my view. Um, <laughs> And, but of course, these machines that were designed to, re and some of them were designed to replace musician, musicians, some of the classic Roland drum machines, the 808, which is now the, you know, the ra rarefied, you know, the instrument of all, all techno and all amazing 80s pop music. This machine was designed so that musicians could have a rhythm section to play along with. So it was designed to replace a drummer, but of course it can't replace a drummer because it's not a drummer. You know, it's not human. It's clocked, it's synchronized, it has its own quality, but then that quality, becomes a genre and that quality becomes its own thing and now electronic music of course has its own personality and has an existence outside of instrumental music it's not instrumental music it's not trying to be instrumental music and i think that also what we what the, another thing that i another term that i use to describe mess is that we're genre agnostic which means that we don't care what you make we're not interested in genre come and make what makes you happy come and make what resonates for you and and i think that one of the funniest things that's happening with genre at the moment is with AI. So there's now a website you can go to which generates speed metal, for example, really good speed metal. If you like speed metal, you can go to this website. You can listen to speed metal for the rest of time and it generates it <laughs> and it never repeats it and it's incredibly com complex and satisfying. And if you like that genre, and you know, and some of my speed metal friends say, oh, but what about us? And he said, well, you know, just make something else. You know, mm. that genre is solved. It's solved. <laughs> it's like on the internet forever. If you know, music so is a mathematical equation, that one's done. That one's done. Saying. That one's solved. <laughs> you know, that one's solved. And so what I think, um, rather than see that as a negative or as this kind of moment of singularity where the AI is taken over, it's actually an opportunity mm. to, to defy that genre or, or move forward from that genre or forwards are terrible. I don't like believe in progress. Don't believe in yeah. progress. Hack it. Exactly. Yeah. Hack it is a much better term. <laughs> to hack that genre, to then come up with a creative way to make something that the AI can't do yet, you know, feed it more data. <laughs> Lisa, I see you nodding your head a lot. Is AI part of your realm in, in future music making? I don't know. Maybe it should be. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I'm interested in the hacking bit, you know, which is the hack the code. Um, and I think that's, that's something that's come up a bit Mm -hmm. whether it's telling a story in a different way, you know, going, who's not in this space? Let's hack the, the way in which that's being, you know, um, how that's processed and how that, uh, that is ex expressed and then whether it's technologies. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's, that's, for me, the fundamental creative act, you know, mm -hmm. that spirit of going, what if, you know, let's muck around with this and not be, you know, kind of too afraid of mm -hmm. those things um, because there are always going to be gatekeepers and there are always going to be... You know, people that things that set themselves up as as traditions. Yeah. But I think, yeah, I think artists are actually pretty good at overcoming <laughs> some of those. Um, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Looking at overcoming, one thing that I note has been a big part of your work in the last couple of years is the Composing Women program, um, but also a dialogue around where women sit in opera mm -hmm. uh, and having an open conversation with the classical music community around how women have, have been not only portrayed, but women have been excluded from certain areas. Um, is that a place to continue to hack? Are we are we hacking well <laughs> currently? Is, is there some inroads uh, into a future where there's greater gender equity? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I, I hope so. I don't think one can talk about um, being future-oriented without that conversation of inclusion and diversity. Um, the Composing Women program was a program set up at the Sydney Conservatorium by Matthew Heinsohn, the composer, and I took over um, four years ago. 
Uh, and it's been really interesting, you know, it really is a program to address equity issues, gender equity issues in classical music, what we saw, and so the program is really a response to data, uh, that at the beginning of um, undergraduate courses, it was a 50-50 gender split in composition. By the end of a four-year course, you've already got women only, you know, a third of a class or a cohort, and then at a postgraduate level, there was this cliff face, you know, women disappeared. Um, which really pointed to the systemic issues that prevented women from progressing. And so this program really set, you know, sets up ways of dealing with that in a, in a structural way in terms of opening up spaces for women not only to interact or to engage with, um, you know, kind of making bridges to the professional world. So we work with um, a lot of partners which are things like orchestras or the Sydney Chamber Opera or Sydney Dance Company. So companies which have a lot of, um, you know, resources and infrastructure. But as soon as, as, soon as um, people are in spaces where they traditionally haven't been, a new story is told, yeah? The thing which just seemed to be, oh, that's just something that happens, then it ripples out. Those, those moments of representation start to matter and it, it, the, the conversations change so much in the last five years. I think that's quite incredible and that gives me a lot of hope in terms of, you know, that, that w hopefully that this has enough traction, mm. that we won't slide back and that sense that, oh, you know, half the population might have something to say. <laughs> and then, you know, other forms of, you know, you know, representation, of course, you know, mm. come into that because it's it's definitely not a binary, but yeah, so. And I hate to be the person to quiet a woman in this moment, <laughs> <laughs> but we are also vastly running out of time and I see through YouTube, there's a lot of questions that have been coming through, which is great, as well as some questions in the audience too that I'd love for us to get to. But to wrap up the conversation just quickly, from each of your individual perspectives, Finish this sentence for me. Aaron, the future of music in Australia is? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I should just point to my T-shirt. <laughs> uh, I think exciting. Um, yeah, exciting, multifaceted and diverse. Miranda, the future of music in Australia is? Collaborative is the word that came to mind. Mm. Yeah. And for you, Lisa? You took mine. <laughs> <laughs> we can collaborate. You collaborate. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, um, a collaboration in the wider sense, which is, which is not just people, but, you know, beyond the human as well, I think, yeah. So, Robin, the future of music for you? <laughs> it's amateur. <laughs> like, in the sense that it's for everybody. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we've got some questions to go to from our YouTube audience. The first one comes to you from Mel Smith, who asks, how do we fund the arts when we have controversial statements by some of our leaders saying it's too elitist and too irrelevant? Opening it to anybody. Uh, Robin, I'm looking at you, Robin, actually, because yeah. <laughs> you've just said it's, it's the future of music in Australia is amateur rather yeah, than yeah. these statements. Yeah, I do. I have very strong feelings about this, about that question, actually. And I, I think that the arts is at a, is at a crisis point in many ways. And, and a lot of things need, need to be addressed. And um, there's a sociologist who uh, formulates a, an idea Called, called the autonomous pole, which I think, uh, the autonomous pole of discourse, which I think is a really useful way to talk about what's hap what happens with the arts and what happens with anything that becomes an elite practice. And so an autonomous pole of discourse is when the, when the pole, like the, the pole in a filter, gets so steep so that the, the discourse around an area becomes so self-referential that you have to be part of that elite to understand it. And once you've created an autonomous pole of discourse, you're not communicating with anybody anymore. You're communicating with this spiralling, introverted universe. And it doesn't just happen in the arts, it happens in all professions. And when I went to law school, for example, that was the, the, the reason I was told that, uh, you know, a lecturer actually said to me at law school, a contract lecturer, he said, do you want to know why we use Latin in the legal profession? It's because we charge $300 an hour and every time we have to explain something, we've made more money. And I thought, well, that's, a, that's why I quit law school, right? But, <laughs> 
<laughs> but it is interesting that a lot of these professions for a long time have, have used you know, language as obfuscation and ways of keeping people away from knowledge and keeping people, it's a way of excluding people. And I think that we have a real problem in Australia with the way we talk about the arts and the way we talk about culture. And we have, over a long period of time, established a deep divide between those who are engaged in culture and believe in it passionately, as, as we all do on this panel, and those people who deride it and do think it's useless and do think that we are just snobs who look down upon them. And we've got a, we've got a huge way to go to, f to bridge that gap, and that gap is, is serious. And you know, I think the pandemic really, really, really brought it to the fore. Mm. Culture just died and nobody cared. People cared about the sport, and I don't want to set up a dichotomy between the arts and sport because I think they're the same thing. They're all part of culture. And, you know, society is richer when we have a rich landscape around us. You know, this is like the, the science has settled on this. People flourish in rich environments. Culture is that rich environment, but it's sport, it's music, it's everything, it's all of it. And so I think that's a very good question and we need to convince these people in power that we're not those elites. But to do that, we have to stop being those elites mm. as well. And I think there's, there's a lot of work to be done. Th there's work both ways, is what it sounds like. Another question that comes through is, what role should organisations like MSO play in nurturing Australian music? Yeah, um, can, I, can I speak? I mean, a bigger one, I think. Uh, this was what came to mind, and then I remembered where, remembered where I was sitting. Um, <laughs> Next to a giant sign. Next to a giant sign. sign, and here we are, and this is an excellent part of that conversation, you know. Um, but yes, you know, and we've all talked about the canon, we've all talked about these big, you know, these big works, which are, which are works of brilliance. And I am not, and I, I love to play, you know, I play historically informed music. Like I literally, I play so much Bach. And, but I don't think Bach is the future of music. Mm -hmm. um, it exists, it's beautiful, we can continue to enjoy it, but it's not collaborative. Mm -hmm. It's not evolving, we can't have a conversation with Bach and ask like, did you actually mean that to be an F sharp? You know, we can't have that conversation. <laughs> Sometimes I wish we could, um, but there's so much around here is what we're talking about. We're talking about the elite. It's that gatekeeping, allowing more people to come in to hear it. When you were talking about stories being told, when if a, if a different story is being told or a different voice is being heard, a different audience comes and that changes the conversation again. And I think the more that that conversation changes, the more the audience will change, but that will, and the audience will evolve uh, and will gain an understanding of what is being said. And that's where the future of, of that music, I think, the, the, I'm, I'm rambling, I feel very strongly about it, but I think it's very, uh, I think more needs to be done off the concert platform. Hmm. I think the concert platform is essential and the big, I'm talking the big, I'm talking Hamer Hall, like that concert platform is essential. I know there's been, all, all of you, all of us have worked in that space and it's so important but those rarefied spaces, those spaces where everyone is welcome, those spaces where people feel like they can engage with the music and not feel like they have to dress up and not feel like they have to mm. be quiet. Not everyone can sit still and be quiet. Mm. That's not something that is, is a place of comfort for a lot of people. And, and flipping it on its yeah. head, not everyone's music is designed to be in that yeah. um, paradigm where the concert stage is here, you perform here, there's an audience over there, you clap at the end, never in between movements. <laughs> and and that's, that's that. Um, you get the glare over the seat. Yeah. You know, <laughs> the music that I, I make and lots of people make is, is for more um, collaborative environments with audience participation and, and to be open and accessible, etc. Did I see someone's hand up with a question just before from our audience who are here with us in Awaki? Or was I imagining it? <laughs> I, I could potentially... <laughs> it was you. We're saying I, it's I you. I don't think I had a question, but I, I've got one now. Great. Oh, hey. Thank you. Um, I'd love to know more about the graphic scores, what was going on mentally to interpret those sort of um, those notations and whether or not there is 
a more exact or interpretive um, nature to that versus the, the traditional notation. Yeah, I, I'm happy to answer that. Um, <laughs> so I think once again, I mean, it, it depends largely on the type of graphic score or the type of, of animated score. So I guess um, in, in this case, it was really quite open. Uh, and so a lot of the, I mean, we're also being informed, I mean, so the, the backing track of those, the African drums kind of really arguably almost form part of the score itself oh. in that, that that actually sort of we're using that to help inform the graphics as well um, and then there are other graphic scores which are entirely less free and in, entirely less interpretive so you know when you look at the works of, of I'll just use Cat Hope as an example because I collaborate with her a lot and she's the artistic director of Decibel and um, working with her on a new, speaking of women in opera, on um, a new opera project this morning, which is, uh, once again, a graphic animated notation score. And so she um, she wrote Speechless. Uh, this was premiered in, I was gonna say 2020, that's kind of been 2019. <laughs> like we lost a year of our lives. Uh, so 2019 uh, in the Perth um, International Arts Festival. And it was an entirely wordless opera. It was just sort of sounds and, and the four soloist singers, well, two of them were, were trained opera singers, but one was um, sort of a shamanic throat singer, uh, and the other was a metal singer. So there was a, you know, having a scream solo in the middle of an opera, but it was, it was a reflection on the, the Forgotten Children um, report. Um, so really looking at that uh, issue of, of you know, immigration detention, particularly related to children. And the entire work was this, this graphic animated notation score, which I was conducting as well, just to try and make sure that everyone, you know, just as you would with a, a normal traditional score, making sure that everyone has exactly the same interpretation of it, and just making sure that they are exactly synced where their parts meet the line, the, the playhead. Um, but her scores are really quite prescriptive. Mm. So you'll have a line that, and you know, which might go like this, and the performer is left to choose their own starting note, but once they've done that, all of the relative changes are very, very clearly mapped out. And so there's really not a lot of, of freedom in some of those scores. Whereas in other scores, there's, there's I said, much more left to, to you know, performers to interpret. There'll be you know, more random sort of squiggly lines that you can kind of interpret as you wish. Um, yeah, so it really depends how the composer decides to, to map out, or in some cases not map out, mm. how the visual maps to, to what the, the performers are supposed to create sonically. Yeah. So it, yeah, it's, it's, it can be, some of the scores can be entirely freeing, others can be really, as I said, prescriptive, and it, it depends entirely on the composer. Yeah. But, but as soon as the performer begins, right, you start to create the, the world mm. of the music. So you're also, you know, following a path and fin in Steph's piece the that that rhythmic kind of momentum was so strong it really carved out a path in which you were following right so that that, that rhythm really is called yeah. uh, ikimanukwa which means to come down so it's a call mm -hmm. it, it's it's a drum rhythm used to to bring uh, someone of significance usually the sovereign to a place to discuss the future so that's that's why i <laughs> used it as this calling rhythm <laughs> in this particular instance we've got one really interesting question that's just popped through from our youtube audience asking if you could wave a magic wand in an ideal world how would classical music look for future generations <laughs> I suppose, I, I mean, that word is already a, a kind of tricky one, the, the idea of, of classical music. I think of classical music as any tradition which is highly articulated and codified. And so Western classical music is definitely one of those. But there are many other classical musics in Indonesia, in Australia, mm. in India. Um, and there's, each of those classical musics prioritise different things, allow you to experience different things. And so if that magic wand, you know, was waved, I think part of that is about having more access points in our education to these other classical musics mm. in order to, you know, access different ways of listening, access different rhythmic skills, for instance. Yeah. 
um, or ways of thinking about, yeah, how do you put sound together, mm. experience it? Yeah. Another great question through is uh, talking about collaboration. So how effective is combining different genres of music like pop music in attracting another generation towards classical. I'm going to aim that at Robin. Why? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think, I mean, you were talking about the, the 808, which mm. for a lot of people interested in pop music of different generations, um, you know, listening to that drum machine being the basis of so much music, as well as hip hop music and, and that type of stuff. Working with pop in a realm where it has an understanding in classical music, is that an intersection that you can see as being relevant and necessary? Does one genre need to entice someone to another? Can they coexist and complement? The relationship, <laughs> I'm just trying to say this as concisely as possible because it's a big question, but the relationship between pop music and classical music is actually a really, really, really old one that goes back to the relationship between the church and the jongleur, which was the minstrel who would go around, you know, uh, spreading the news through song, popular song. And the church was starting to codify uh, musical traditions. You know, this is a very, very old story, and I'm talking entirely about Western classical music. Mm -hmm. um, and so that relationship was always antagonistic, actually. And there's a really interesting a book, which I, one of my favorite books on music is written by a French economist called Jacques, Jacques Attali. It's called um, Noise and the Political Economy of Music. And I just rec recommend if you're interested in any of this stuff, read that book, it's fantastic. It's great to read a book about music written by an economist. It's a very strange experience. <laughs> um, but that, so that relationship I think has just been sort of continuous all the way through until the present day. So the idea that you can somehow encourage people to listen to classical music through pop music. Like, to, like to me, it just seems like a, a an oxymoron in many ways. Um, what I think I try and do all the time with this genre agnosticism is just to talk about how incredibly intricate and difficult um, pop music can be you know, in the same way that this highly codified practice of classical music can be. And that both of these things have incredible qualities and that they're, they're equally valid. I think, I think just talking about validity, you know, what, what is a valid expression? What is a valid musical expression? So as soon as we start to have a conversation that, that prioritizes one over the other, we're, we've lost the, lost the plot, we've lost the point. And so, and I always say to some of my more serious composer friends, you know, who, are, who might be dismissive of pop music, I say, try and write a hip hop song. It is so hard. It is so, I've tried many times. It's so hard, <laughs> so hard. It's really, really difficult, like almost impossible. And if it was easy, we'd all be doing it, you know. There is an incredible um, depth in, in pop music that I think we completely gloss over, often from, from the classical side of the fence. And then from the pop side of the fence, there are a whole lot of misconceptions and assumptions that are made about the classical music world. What, and, and, you know, I just think that that, that that divide, like I said, is historical and long and deep. And um, I just think that changing the way that we talk to those genres, but then also changing the way that we talk to one another about them is, is much more fundamental in terms, and I, I just don't think that there's a musical answer to that question. You know, like, what's the perfect piece of pop music that would encourage somebody to listen to a Mahler symphony? I don't think that that's an equation. You know, I don't think that that's an equation that's gonna follow. Yeah, well, outside the, the sampling world, I guess, mm. uh, on the odd occasion we do have pop songs that sample classical music and mm. in a small way attract a few people across. I see what you're saying. Yeah, They're well, we pl I play a game at my house with the kids, for example. We do Renaissance Night where we turn all the devices off and we draw pictures and listen to Renaissance music. Night. Renaissance Night. Renaissance Night, right? Excellent. <laughs> and, and one of the things, I have a very strange record collection. <laughs> and so I say to the kids, was particularly when they were younger, I'd just say, go and, go and pick a record off the shelf. So it could be anything from Gesualdo, you know, all the way through to, to a harsh noise record. So it's like with everything in between. So basically they go to the record, you know, they pull a record off and we have to listen to both sides. It's gotta be side A, side B, you know, it's a, it's a commitment. 
and I just think that it's really, what was really fascinating to me watching that process sort of play out was how interested and engaged those kids were, especially when they were sort of around that sort of seven or eight years old, when something really unfamiliar um, was presented to them orally, you know, they, they didn't turn their nose up at it, they had questions about it and we talked about it. And then by talking about it and me discussing what I thought the intention of this was and why it sounded the way it did, those conversations, are just, they just open people's ears, you know, to, to all of those things. And, um, you know, so just things like that would help. Kids are much more open-minded than we would think to mm. all these different genres if, if you just give them access to it. And, uh, but actually, just to follow up on that, I don't think it's just kids. I, I think as we were discussing yesterday, maybe, that there's, I think that curatorially, you know, festivals, programs, everything, I think there's, it, in Australia, historically, it's far too conservative that we're always too worried about what the audience wants to hear and that we don't actually program things that are, and I'm not talking about being challenging or provocative necessarily, but just being different. Like putting something that's unexpected on a program is actually something that people respond really well to, I've found when I've programmed things, you know, that people want new and interesting things. But we just assume often from the programming side of, of culture that we have to be safe and we have to just mm. give, give people what they want. And Keith Humble, the composer I talked about earlier, had a great response to a question from my father in an interview that was done on radio many years ago, where my father, who, who, who doesn't like serialism and 12-tone music, right? Doesn't like it, fair enough. It's not for everybody. So, um, and he, and Keith was writing music of that, of that, uh, you know, genre. And, and my father said, do you ever, do you ever think about the audience? You know, because to my father, it was a sort of an act of punishment to have to listen to music like that. <laughs> and, um, and Keith had a really good answer where he sort of said, he sort of flipped this idea because I think, I think the insinuation was that it's kind of an arrogant thing to, to present this to an audience. And, and, and Keith had a really interesting answer where he sort of said, no, I, I think it would be deeply arrogant of me to assume what an audience wants to hear. Mm. I, I make my music, I love what I make, I present what I make, and I hope that in presenting that, I will convey that sense to the audience. And I just thought, I just thought it was a really great answer to, to th that it is an act of supreme arrogance to assume as an artist that you know what an audience wants. And to turn the emphasis around, I think what we've all been discussing and, and discovering through our discussion here is that the audience wants to hear full stop. They, they want to be there and, and listen to what we've got to say and present with all of these different programs. Thank you so much to the audience here with us and hearing us this evening, both in the Awaki and at home with our YouTube audience. A huge thank you to our Ears Wide Open presenting partner, Tarawara Estate, and to Creative Victoria and to the City of Melbourne for their support for tonight's event. Murakoze, thank you so much to this amazing panel. Robin Fox, Lisa Lim, Miranda Hill, and Aaron Wyatt. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>